Hello, and uh, welcome to the newest episode of El Dino, only on RiotRadio.ca, and currently from YouTube Live, and a bunch of other stuff that we do that I can't remember. So today, we are talking about more dinosaurs. My name is Eldon Atkin, and uh, we're moving through the 37 Canadian dinosaurs I found a month ago. Not personally found them, uh, I wish I did. Uh, but I'm talking about them. So today, we've finally broken through the Bs, and now we're into Cs, and 1D. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, today we have, and this is going to be a really hard name to say, uh, Chiro Stenotes. Um, kind of cool. Then we have Corythosaurus and Displatosaurus. So, a carnivore, sorry, two carnivores, I guess, and a herbivore. Kind of cool. And uh, we're going to jump right into it. So, our first one is... Uh, Chiro stenotes. Uh, it is uh, its name comes from the Latin for narrow hand. I thought originally it said ha head. It's not head. It is hand. Um, it lived during the late Jurassic period, seventy nine to sixty seven million years ago. Uh, but some websites say that it lived during the Campion of the Cretaceous, which would be sixty or sorry eighty three point five to sixty six million years ago. Unfortunately, I go through a lot of different websites. Not all of them agree. Um, so this one is kind of one of those ones where you don't have all the information sometimes. Now, it was it's had a complicated history, that's for sure. Uh, it was named by Charles Whitney Gilmore in 1924. Partial remains were found in Alberta in the Dinosaur Park Formation. Originally, it was uh, found by George Sternberg in 1914. And the first person to study them was Lawrence Lamb. So we've all heard Sternberg, Gilmore, and Lamb before. This is kind of one of the ones that all the paleontologists kind of had their hands on. So Lamb passed away before he could name it. So Charles Gilmore named the hands that were being studied after using Lamb's notes. Now, in the classic world of fossils, Charles Sternberg said the feet of uh, Chirostenotes was not its feet and named it macro um, phalangia in 1932. So it's thought to be from a large dinosaur in the ornithomimid family. Ornithomimid means bird mimic. Then in 1940, Raymond Sternberg, who I think is the son of uh, um, George. So <laughs> he uh, found the beak and he said that it was a different thing altogether. Then he thought it was from, not a, from a bird, not a dinosaur. And then in 1960, Alexander Wetmore broached the idea that the jaw was from an ornithomimid as well. So after all was said and done, we have 26 different specimens found. And jumping forward, we think they all belong to Chirostenotes. We're not entirely sure, uh, but we're, we're hoping. I think I have a picture up, or we will put, sorry, if it's already up. I know I'm, so, I'm supposed to do this, but just kind of showing what we have from it. Um, so Chirostenotes was a smaller dinosaur, around two meters long, so 6.6 .6 feet, so longer than I am tall, and was about a meter tall, so about three feet. Uh, it could have weighed up to 66 pounds, so like a, a pretty big turkey. Uh, it was probably an omnivore, and this is based on the idea that others in this family were also omnivores. So think Ovaraptor, um, any of those kind of like cassowary looking ones, that's probably what it was. Now, it had specially evolved hands, uh, with the second claw being longer, like that of an eye eye. So when you see eye eyes, I think it's their middle finger is quite longer than the rest of them. And that middle finger is used as a kind of like a tool to get into cracks and crevices to hook onto prey and pull them out. So the adaptation would let it reach into these little crevices and pull things out. Um, you do see some of these actually. One of the only dinosaurs that we've kind of seen in uh, pop culture. Uh, the Walking with Dinosaurs um, 3D movie from I think 20... Oh, I think it was 2009 or 2010 that was animated. It's, it's not, I guess it's CGI, but it's from Canada. Uh, you see a couple of these ones kind of harassing the main antagonist. I guess protagonist. So cheers to Nozis. Um, one of our first ornithomimids in the Oviraptor family, uh, bird mimic, kind of cool little sucker. I have a nice little picture of Paleowal Earth as well that should be seen, or has been seen. Um, but yeah, that's kind of our first one. Very interesting to say the least that it's, it, it had this wide 
variety of 26 specimens, but everybody wanted to name it a different thing. It's like you haven't seen this really the since like the Bone Wars, and the Bone Wars is when a bunch of paleontologists uh, either stole or, you know, named or renamed whatever. They just kept taking bones, naming it new things, because back in the day, it was cool to have things named after you or to have named them. So it's kind of the first one we see where like its hands, its feet, its beak all belong to it, but it was then named three different things. Now, moving on to our next dinosaur is Corythosaurus, which name means helmet lizard. Now, Corythosaurus is a hadrosaur. Really cool, kind of like Brachylophosaurus from last week. Uh, it was discovered by Barnum Brown in 1914, but it was originally found in 1912. So in classic dinosaurs, you see it being discovered, you know, two to three to even like years before and not being properly named until after the fact. Now it was found in Alberta and also in Montana. It lived during the Campion of the Cretaceous period around 76 to 74 million years ago. Now, multiple specimens have been found, some almost complete with soft tissue remains and impressions like Brachylophosaurus. One of the best finds was a fossilized tail with skin and calcified tendons. So tendons don't fossilize nicely, but this one have to be calcified so it, it was hard enough that it didn't degrade. We think the largest it could have gotten was 9 meters, which is 25 to 30 feet long, but some individuals could have been larger, not entirely sure. The skull, now this is the wild thing, the skull alone could be as big as 70.6 centimeters long, which is uh, <laughs> 2.32 feet, so two and like two and a third foot. That's a pretty big skull. And it was tall too, because this had this big helmet, this big crest on its head that really would have made the head much larger than it would have been normally. With that being said, it was named after, this is the really cool thing, it was named after the Corinthian helmets worn by the ancient Greeks. So the head crest, it was hollow, sort of like Par Paralophosaurus, where it had that nice kind of, um, I guess, crest. Uh, putting Corythosaurus in the Lambiosaurine family of the hadrosaurs, my favorite of all hadrosaurs is the Lambiosaurus. Uh, this genera includes Paralophosaurus, as I mentioned, and the origin of the name, Lambiosaurus. So Lambiosaurus is kind of like the hollow type. It is the precursor. It is what the, the family is named after. So Corythosaurus had this crest, and we can think of a couple things the crest could have done. So the crest was hollow, which led to a couple ideas. The first idea is that it could have been used to produce sound or acted as an alarm system. So again, you look at elephants when they trumpet you look at any kind of herbivore that can like make a loud noise deer snort some whistle this would have probably helped it in that situation now that's one theory and if this theory is correct though that would mean or at least it would lead to the idea that it would have traveled in herds now when you have a herd you think okay what's going to lead a herd could be matriarchal could be patriarchal like a mustang and modern day um, horses or matriarchal like elephants we're not entirely sure, but this theory could mean that it would be a dominant male or female acting as like a lookout, kind of like how elephants do it, or again, other animals. This also would have been a very unique idea because they, they're, for their skulls, we know they had really hypersensitive ear bones. Now the hypersensitive ear bone, it means they could hear very well. So when you're a herbivore, you want to be able to be like, to be able to hear your predators. And this idea would make sense. So herd behavior also increases the chance of survival. When you are, you know, 30 animals in a herd, that's a lot of eyes to look out for predators instead of being by yourself. Now, another more mundane idea is that the crest would have been kind of like a, a hollow to reduce the weight of the skull. When you have such a large skull and this ornamental crest, it could be used for mating. It could be, you know, could be this fancy thing the males had it, the females had it. It doesn't really matter, kind of like how deer have antlers. But when you have such a large crest, if it's too heavy, it's going to weigh down your head. So having a hollow crest would make more sense. Um, as I said, it could have been used for mating or territorial battles. At the time that Corythosaurus roamed the earth, there would have also been other kinds of Lambiosaurids. And uh, having like a unique crest would have been able to say, hey, I'm a Corythosaurus. Look at my crest. Your crest is different. You're not one of me. I'm going to go try to find my other family. And that kind of 
identifies in some ways. Now, for food, and this is kind of a cool thing too, an animal that we know, we probably can guess what it could eat. Um, some people think that since their beaks and jaws weren't very strong, they would have probably ate mostly marine vegetation. Marine vegetation is softer. It's been in the water, so it's not hard like any kind of a grasses or trees or anything like that. And it would have been easier to prune and digest. Now, this is kind of based off of the fact that other hadrosaurs and lambiosaurs we think ate the same thing. On the flip side, though, others think that since most of the jaws are incomplete, we really can't tell what the bite force or what the pressure it could have put out was. So it's kind of not correct to guess it would only eat this because we're not sure. We don't know. Now, again, we'll see what happens, but we know what probably ate it too. Uh, predators of Corthosaurus would have been Albertosaurus, which we heard of in the first episode, or even the big guy himself, or big girl herself, Tyrannosaurus, because they would have lived at the same time. So T-Rex could have preyed on Corthosaurus. T-Rex is this, again, giant dinosaur, giant predator, kind of like the apex. It would have been big enough to prey on Corthosaurus. And our last dinosaur today, which is, I think, not our first Tyrannosaurid, but the first of the species. So we have Displatosaurus. Now, Displatosaurus, if you ever played the game Fossil, I think it's Fossil Fighters, he was called Displato, had like, he had like, he had like weird like rocks on him. His name, or its name, means Frightful Lizard. Now, Displatosaurus, really cool. It's from the Taurosaur family, um, which includes Gorgosaurus, I think Tarbosaurus. Some really cool theropods. Theropods being the meat-eating dinosaurs on two legs. Now, it was named by Dale Allen Russell in 1970, but it was discovered in 1921 near Steveville, Alberta, by Charles Mortram Sternberg. Now, Russell also said that the holotype collected by Barnum Brown in 1913 was also a paratype of Displatosaurus. So you might think to yourself, what's a holotype? What's a paratype? I looked it up, so I knew it too. So a holotype is a single type specimen upon which the description and name of a new species is based. So holotype being the first. A paratype in zoology and botany, a paratype is a species of an organism that helps define the scientific name of a species and other taxon actually representing but is not the holotype. So basically a paratype helps to solidify what it is, but the holotype is the kind of like the, the what names it. So a partial skeleton with a skull, shoulder, forelimb, pelvis, femur, and all the vertebrae from the neck, torso, hip, and the first 11 tail vertebrae have been found. Really cool. A lot of dinosaur, not a complete specimen, but enough. It was found in Alberta in the Judith River group and in Montana in the Judith River formation. Apparently Judith River kind of goes across. It lived during the Campion of the Cretaceous 78 to 74 million years ago, and it was up to 8 to 9 meters long, so that's 28 to 30 feet, that's a big dinosaur, and could have been as tall as 3 meters, which is approximately 9.10 feet tall. So also not a small theropod by any means. Um, it would have, we think it could have weighed up to 2 to 3 metric tons. Metric tons, basically take a metric ton, and if you want to convert it to short tons, you just put 0.2 or 0.3. I, I don't really know what short tons are, but that's kind of how it goes. It's known from six well-preserved specimens, as well as some other scattered bones that we think are the same. So the really cool thing is, and again, with these dinosaurs being discovered and not being named yet. So until 1970, Displatosaurus wasn't recognized as its own species. It was thought to be a specimen of a Gorgosaurus, which is in the family, so it makes sense. The idea that both these dinosaurs were active in the same area at the same time kind of helps that as well, because you have two dinosaurs that look very similar. Of course, finding the skull, we at least got to look at it a little more and kind of put an, a magnifying glass to it and say, hey, this isn't the same thing, but it's kind of cool to see that. Now, Displatosaurus is much more powerfully built, though, comparatively to Gorgosaurus. So the similarity in size between these two dinosaurs, we think they filled a different niche, sort of like how, like, if you had gray wolves and timber wolves, timber wolves could prey on a bit larger, or it might even say, it might be incorrect to say timber wolves, let's say, you know, wolves and bears. Bears can prey on different things that wolves could not, or would not normally, and that's kind of the thought with this. So the one little caveat to this whole idea is that 
we found a hadrosaur with signs of predation from Displatosaurus. Now, we think Displatosaurus, this big hulking dinosaur, could have taken down mostly whatever it wanted. Hadrosaurs were fast. Displatosaurus is big, hefty. It probably wasn't a, a chase down your prey kind of predator. But finding, a hadro finding this hadrosaur could mean a lot of things. So first of all, it could mean that Displatosaurus uh, could have preyed on this thing, which is, okay, that's kind of that's kind of wild when you think, it's like having a bear chase down, I don't know, an antelope. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think so. Um, or it could have opportunist opportunistically preyed on, like an ambush predator, or it could have scavenged it. We're not, we're not really sure. The idea, though, is, is that this big monster did not prey on the quicker prey. It preyed on the slow movers. It preyed on the heavy armor dinosaurs, because when you have a jaw that can crack bone, you don't really care if they have armor. You're going to get through it. So Displatosaurus is very similar to Tyrannosaurus in the sense that it's bulky. Tyrannosaurus is bigger, of course, but the same kind of idea. Tyrannosaurus could eat what it wanted. Its, its jaws were so strong. Displatosaurus is thought to be kind of similar to that. And they are related, which is kind of cool. Uh, originally, some people thought that Displatosaurus actually was an early Tyrannosaurus um, I guess just, it was earlier Tyrannosaurus, it would, ev it would evolve into that, but it's been disproven that Displatosaurus is its own thing. It's not a T-Rex kind of uh, precursor like Guan Long, uh, which is kind of, a Tyrannos kind of the first Tyrannosaurus, we think. Now, some thought that it might have been a pack hunter. And when you, think of, when you think of big dinosaurs, pack hunting makes sense, more success rates, but more mouths to feed. Look at African wild dogs, lions, wolves. All these animals have all these extra mouths to feed, but they have a higher success rate because you have so many more hunters. The idea kind of migrates to this, but also when you think of the fact that you're, you know, 30 feet long and nine, nine feet tall, that's a lot of food you got to eat. So the idea comes from the fact that we found a skull of a juvenile, or at least a younger Displatosaurus, with bite marks in the head. And the bite marks was from an older Displatosaurus. The teeth marks match up, and the bite itself wasn't meant to be lethal. It was more like how you see wolves, you know, bite each other in the face for dominance. That's the idea that this older Displatosaurus may have thrown its weight around, kind of gave Junior a bite on the noggin and said, hey, you know, wise up, I'm in charge. And with that being said, it makes sense that it would be a pack hunter or at least a social animal or a social dinosaur, because when you're not biting to kill, you're biting to teach. I don't recommend doing that to children or anybody nowadays, but when you're a dinosaur, you get away with it. So the other uh, case where we th see Displatosaurus uh, in this idea of social interactions with others is there's a bone bed with three Displatosauruses and five Hadrosaurs. Now, it's all the same bone bed. We know the ages of at least two of the, the Displatosauruses. One was juvenile. One was an adult, and one, we're not really sure what age it was. Um, of the five Hadrosaurus, we didn't care because we know Hadrosaurus are herd animals. But Displatosaurus, we're like, hey, there's three of them, what happened? Now, there's two main theories. A, the, it could have been a river flooding, and these three could have been in the area, swept along, and all drowned. But more likely, it was a catastrophic environmental hazard. We've had catastrophic, yeah, catastrophic envi environmental hazards like last week, like a volcano erupting. You're not going to survive that if you're a dinosaur. You don't have an umbrella big enough, you're dosed. So that's the kind of cool thing about Displatosaurus is we think that it might have been a pack hunter. That's kind of cool. It was this big sucker. It was meaty. It was kind of our, our largest predator we've talked about so far. Albertosaurus is cool. I like Albertosaurus. But Displatosaurus is a special place in my heart. Now, with that being said, though, that is all the dinosaurs we talked about today. So we had Chirostenotsis, Corythosaurus, and Displatosaurus. So Ornithomimid, bird mimic, Hadrosaur, duck-billed dinosaur, and a, and, um, a Tyrannosaurid, so a theropod, two-legged meat-eating dinosaur. A nice mixture. We're not all talking ceratopsians today. You're talking ankylosaurs. So it's nice that we kind of broke it up. Next week, we're going to talk more dinosaurs. Let's start with letter D. We're all done with C. We've covered A, B, and C. If you haven't seen the other episodes, I recommend checking them out. There's a playlist. I really enjoy the show, and I hope you do as well. Um, so with that being said, though, my name's Eldon Atkin. Thank you for joining me today, as always, on Eldino. I will catch you next week where we talk more about dinosaurs and, uh, yeah, get through these 37 Canadian dinosaurs. Uh, thank you again for watching, and goodbye.